my name is Celeste and if you've never seen me before, I host a show called Yarn to Table, which is all about my knitting life. In 2018, I'm hosting a year-long knit-along, or cow, called the Fiber Quest Cow. And if you'd like to know more about the cow generally, I do have a video that is just on the cow that you can check out. It's uh, on my channel, and I'll also link it below here. Um, this video is going to talk about the first land that we will be entering for the months of January and February. It is the land of camelids. And that means that you're going to knit a project with some kind of camelid fiber and enter for a shot to win a beautiful skein of more camelid fiber. So in this video, I want to talk to you about what camelids are, what different camelids we usually take our fiber from, how those vary, how they're different from wool, what benefits and challenges they have, what types of projects they're suited to, and all that fun stuff. It should be really educational and interesting. I am also going to share with you the camelid fiber you will stand the chance to win if you enter this cow, the camelid uh, yarn that I'm going to be using for my project for the Land of Camelids, and a camelid sweater that I knit myself in the last year so that I can share some of the benefits and challenges that I found personally um, just in that particular project. It kind of um, We'll talk about all those things in the abstract and then you can get uh, a solid example from my own knitting experience. So I think this is going to be a really interesting video and I hope you will stick around. So the camelid family uh, includes five different fiber producing animals, okay? There is the uh, camel, um, and then there are four, so the camel is from the old world, then there are four South American descendants of the camel, and those are the famous alpaca and llama, and then the perhaps less well-known um, guanaco and visunya. Now, the guanaco and the visunya do produce beautiful fiber, as I said. However, they have been listed as endangered and um, protected species, uh, respectively. And um, that means that their fiber is very difficult or impossible to get a hold of, depending on where you're living. It's in short supply, and it's not exactly a great choice for anyone who's interested in sustainable sourcing of fiber. So setting those two to the side, um, they are usually not a big part of a knitter's life. We're instead going to talk about the three camelids that are commonly used in um, fiber and in fiber arts like knitting. And so those, as I said, are alpaca, llama, and camel. And they are most commonly used in that order. Alpaca is the most common fiber that you will see, followed by llama and then camel. So that's the order that we're going to talk about them. And um, let's get into it. So I do have my notes to the side, so please excuse me. That's why I keep looking over there, if that's not obvious to anyone. <laughs> So alpacas have been um, bred and prized for their fiber since 4000 BC, which is pretty incredible. Um, that is around the same time that uh, sheep started to be used in that way. Um, so people in the old world and the new world who had not connected with each other were each separately using fiber. And in the new world, that fiber primarily belonged to alpacas and related animals like llamas. So I think that's really cool to keep in mind because we a lot of times have a very old world centric way of thinking about fiber arts and um, wool is obviously super awesome. Um, but let's remember that there are fiber arts traditions in the Americas that go back about as far and are very much camelid centric. So that's important to remember when we're thinking about the history of this art form. Um, almost 99% of the world's alpaca population is still found in the highlands of Peru, Chile, and um, Bolivia. And within the alpaca species, there are two breeds, um, the Wakaya and the Surrey. So the Wakaya make up about 90% of the population. That's by far going to be the one that you're most likely to find. Um, and they produce a, produce a denser fiber and it has a little bit more of a crimp to it. Whereas the Surrey kind of have like a longer, silkier fiber. Um, both are very beautiful, but it's more likely that you're going to come up against the Wakaya. And you're usually not going to see the breed listed 
on the actual yarn. So if you are interested in trying something from Missouri, I would really recommend going to some kind of fiber festival or looking into sourcing the fiber as directly as you can um, from the breeders because they're going to be the ones that know that kind of stuff. Um, so regardless of the breed, all alpacas produce a coarse um, beard hair and those are going to be discarded and those are also mixed within this sort of softer, woolier uh, hair which is what we use to produce fiber. So let's talk a bit about how that fiber compares to wool. What's different about it? What's better for certain uses? What is more challenging for certain uses? Um, so the fibers are longer than wool, first of all. They are about four and a half to 11 inches, which is about 11 and a half to 28 centimeters. And they're very strong and durable, which means they make for really great hard wearing items. However, they are not elastic in that lovely way that wool is so springy, alpaca, no. If you are knitting ribbing in something with alpaca, well, that's a nice decorative effect, but it's not exactly going to have the, uh, the function that ribbing often has in a wool garment, okay? So keep that in mind. It's not, although it's hard wearing, you might think, oh, that'd be good for socks, right? No, they're not good for socks because socks need to have a lot of negative ease and stretch and fit on your foot and not, you know, the alpaca is just going to slide right off, okay, because it does not have elastic. Um, you can find alpaca socks. I think generally when you find them, they're commercially made with elastic fibers, like stretchy fibers in there to make them fit your foot the way you would find a commercial cotton sock or anything else like that. Um, so for hand-knit socks, not going to be my biggest recommendation. But it has a beautiful drape. And this drape is really well suited to certain garments and um, pretty much any kind of shawl or cowl if you like that drapey look. Um, but keep in mind that it's going to be good for something like a drapey cardigan, right? But it's not going to be good for like a pullover that needs a lot of structure and has like a high funnel neck, right? That's all just going to fall. So you got to keep that in mind when you're making something with alpaca. Um, it has similar moisture wicking qualities to wool. Um, it can absorb a lot of moisture without becoming wet. Um, but it doesn't have uh, lanolin because alpacas don't secrete lanolin. So it's not going to be that kind of impermeable, um, almost waterproof thing that they used to make fishermen's sweaters out of with all the lanolin and it would keep you dry in a thunderstorm essentially. So it's good for moisture wicking, um, but doesn't have a lanolin. Now the benefit of not having lanolin is that a lot of people are sensitive to lanolin. A lot of people will say that they have a wool allergy and it's really the lanolin. Um, so alpaca can be really great for if you're knitting for those people or if you are someone like that yourself. Um, now alpaca has fewer scales than wool. So what that means is if you look at the fiber under a microscope, you are going to see these almost like the shingles of a roof. You're gonna see a long thread and it's broken up with little scales, okay? And that's where the new growth starts, each growth period. You're gonna see the same thing if you pluck out one of your hairs and look at that under a microscope. Um, now, all animal fibers are gonna have this, except silk, which we'll talk about later. It doesn't have scales because it's not a hair. It's a liquid that is secreted. Um, but alpaca has fewer scales than wool, and what that means is that it has a shinier appearance. So silk is super shiny because it has no scales at all, and alpaca is shinier than wool. That makes it look really lustrous, really gorgeous. Now, some things to keep in mind with that is um, those scales are what helps wool to felt. So alpaca, although you can get it to felt, it doesn't felt as easily as wool. So think about that. Um, and also think about the fact that a very shiny, lustrous, beautiful uh, fiber like alpaca, it's going to show a lot of flaws when it's in stockinette, um, which if you're not, you know, if you're fine with flaws or if you are at the point where you're not going to be knitting in a lot of flaws and you, you know, you feel like you want to challenge yourself, so be it. Um, if you're worried about that, you might want to look into a pattern that has some kind of texture, like a seed stitch. Um, something along those lines.
However, be careful because once you start getting into the really complex textures like cables, you are adding a lot of weight and alpaca is already an incredibly dense fiber, okay? So if you're making a beautiful drapey cardigan and it has just the right drape to it and then you add a bunch of cables, that's going to sort of pull the drape too much and then it's going to have like the wrong shape on your body. Um, so you got to keep that in mind. Maybe a little bit of texture, maybe not too much texture, depending on what you're going for. Um, now, here's something really interesting. Alpacas are bred in more than 22 individual shades. Those are the colors that they grow in their fiber. So you can find undyed fiber in more than 20 shades, which is amazing. It's really cool if you want to do grayscale color work with undyed fiber. I mean, really amazing. Um, if you are just into undyed fiber and you want more options, that's super cool. And one of the neat things about it too is that um, you can get a pure white, whiter than wool, um, without having to bleach it. So with the wool, you usually bleach the wool and then you color it from there. Um, and one thing about this, like I said, alpaca is not as good as wool is for felting, but it will felt. Now, if you want to felt something and you want it to be a bright white, alpaca is a good option because the bleaching process of the wool, it takes off a lot of those scales in the same way that superwash processing does, and it makes it much more difficult for that to felt. And so for that color, you're actually gonna be better if you go with alpaca. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind for any of you felters out there. So like I said, um, the alpaca can be grown in up to uh, more than I think 22 different shades and those range from bright white all the way through different tans and browns and grays and all the way to a jet black color. And usually for dyeing, um, you know, you can't just get white alpaca for all your dyeing needs and so often what they do is they find one of the shades in the middle that is um, similar in tone to the color they want to be dyeing it. And for that reason, a lot of times the alpaca that you get is not going to have um, as intense, um, as vibrant a color as it might have on wool. Um, it can be really beautiful, um, but it's just not going to take the dye exactly the same way that wool does, so keep that in mind. So, let's talk about softness. When it comes to softness, what we like to measure is the micron count, and that has to do with how thick the fibers are. Um, now, alpaca averages 18 to 26 micron count, which is in the range of some merinos and some cashmere. So, it's very, very soft. Um, now, it can be worn next to the skin because it's so soft, it makes a really good um, scarf, anything like that. It also makes great baby garments because babies can be sensitive. Um, now, also like cashmere, it's extremely warm, um, but like I said, while cashmere is much lighter than wool, alpaca is actually denser than wool. So you wanna keep in mind how heavy you want that accessory or garment to end up being. If you're looking for something really, really soft and warm, but not heavy and not with that drape, cashmere is gonna be more your speed. But if you are okay with it being heavy and you want that drape and you want that shine, then alpaca is good. Now, to find the very softest, you want to look on the label for a baby alpaca. Um, that's going to be especially good if you are not shopping in person and you can't feel it yourself, like if you're shopping online. Um, of course, if you are shopping in person, you can pretty much tell for yourself how lovely and soft anything is. So let's now talk a bit about llama and camel and how they differ from alpaca, okay? So llamas, as an animal, they're taller and they're less docile than our alpacas, and they're actually often used as guard animals for a flock of sheep or even a flock of our alpaca. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Now when you look at a llama, they look more rugged from the outside, and you might think that their wool would not be as lustrous and soft as the alpaca. However, that is because they grow a true dual coat. So while the alpaca does have beard hairs mixed in there with the softer hairs that have to be removed, um, the llama grows 
an entire layer of um, what are called guard hairs on the outside and then next to the skin they grow this really lovely soft downy wool that once you've removed the guard hairs um, it's pretty much going to be indistinguishable from alpaca. Um, so the process of removing the guard hairs, however, is a little bit more complicated and labor intensive than removing the beard hairs from an alpaca. And that is one of the major reasons that alpaca fiber is more commonly found than llama fiber. So llama is pretty much really, really similar to alpaca, but for some, um, for some companies, um, it's like the production is not exactly worth it, so they just feel like alpacas are a better investment. Um, but once produced, uh, once processed, I mean, um, the fibers are actually really, really similar. So like uh, alpaca, llama fiber is very lustrous, it's very drapey, um, it's not elastic at all, and it's more difficult to dye a vibrant color, but it does come in a beautiful range of natural colors. So when it comes to actually buying the fiber, um, there's not a huge difference between alpaca and llama. And I thought that was interesting to know because you might think llama is like better or nicer or something because it's a little bit more rare, but that really just has to do with how the production works. Now camel is actually fairly different, which makes sense because it's a more distant relative, right? So while apacas and llamas are mainly raised in South America, camels, um, they come from the old world. And uh, today their hair is mostly sourced from China, Mongolia, Iran, Afghanistan, Russia, as well as New Zealand and Australia and even Tibet. Um, so lots of um, different places there, primarily in um, Asia, and then a little bit in Oceania. So I thought that was interesting. Um, now you probably know that there are one humped and two humped camels. Now those are actually two different breeds of camels, and um, they live in different places and they have very different coats. So the one humped is called the Dromedara, and that's the camel that lives in desert regions. Um, it grows a really short coat, and they pretty much are not used for their fiber at all. Um, these are the camels that I'm probably the most familiar with. I went to the Middle East uh, when I was about 20, I was 21, um, and I rode a camel, and it was almost certainly one of this breed, because um, I was in the middle of the desert. Now, the two-humped camel, um, that is called the Bactrian, and it lives in colder climates, and that means that, of course, it grows a thick coat in winter. Now, I bet I heard your ears perk up. Does it sound like that might be the one that's more interesting to knitters? Yes, that would be the one that we are most interested in. So, like llamas, camels grow a true dual coat, right? So they have these really harsh um, guard hairs on the outside and then a soft warm downy hair next to their skin and um, what's really cool is that they grow this undercoat in the winter time to keep them insulated and then in the spring they have a molting um, which is actually very similar to what happens with cashmere goats which we'll talk about uh, in the next land of fiber but they molt and um, these big clumps of their fur actually just starts falling off and then what happens is people hand gather it, they sort it, um, they remove all of the guard hairs, and then that is the fiber that they produce into camel yarn. So now that you know a little bit about where it comes from, um, let's talk about how the fiber, once processed, compares to llama and alpaca fiber. So as you remember, alpaca and llama fiber, once processed, pretty much very, very similar. Similar animal, okay? Here's how camel is different though. Um, the hairs are much shorter. So they're around one to three inches, which is about 2.5 to 7.5 centimeters, okay? So it's nowhere near as long as the alpaca and llama fibers. Um, however, it does have a similar micron count. So remember that has to do with softness. The micron count here is an average of 19 to 24. So again, it's gonna be in that merino and into cashmere range. Um, now, like alpaca and llama, there is very little crimp, very little elasticity, and um, trouble felting um, and bleaching. And 
that has to do with um, fewer scales and just uh, a kind of different makeup to the fiber there. Um, but what's most different between the camel and the alpaca or llama, so as we've heard, they, they both have that nice shine, nice drape. Um, the camel hair is shorter, right? Now here's the big difference. The camel hair is not dense. In fact, it is lighter than wool. So it's going to be more in that cashmere direction. If you're looking for something that is warm and soft but light, camel is going to be a great direction. And so for this reason, it's often used in the way cashmere would be used. It is often blended with wool in order to make a yarn that is softer um, and warmer and also lighter. So obviously you're not going to have to worry about adding too much weight when you do cables and things like that if you're using camel um, or camel wool blend. So although camels are more closely related to llamas and alpacas um, than they are to, you know, sheep or cashmere goats, obviously, and although their fur has a lot in common, the density is going to be a big difference there, um, and that is going to determine what kind of item you want to make out of it. Um, so that's going to affect the drape and everything else. So um, keep that in mind. So. Now let's um, talk a little bit about the prize that you could win if you enter the finished object thread, which will be drawn at the end of February. Oh, no, those are mine. This is it. <laughs> this is going to be your prize. Um, this is a beautiful skein of Mirasol Pakupura, which is an extra fine alpaca. Does it say baby alpaca? Extra fine Peruvian alpaca. Yeah, so this is going to be, it's very, very close to skin soft. Extremely beautiful. Um, it is a number two, or a sport weight, or a fine. Um, and this skein has, uh, like I said, 100% alpaca, and it is 300 meters, or 329 yards, and that's for 100 grams. And the really cool thing about this yarn, other than how soft it is, is you can see the color variants here. This is all undyed. So remember when I talked about how alpacas can be grown in a variety of different shades? This is one of the very, very cool things that you can do with that, is you can harvest from a number of alpacas, some that have this beautiful peachy shade, some with this closer to a white shade, and some with this gray, and then spin it all together to create a gorgeous, variegated, undyed yarn. So I think that this skein is so gorgeous and that it really, really celebrates some of the things that are totally unique about alpaca. So um, I'm really excited to give this away. I'm going to be a little bit jealous of whoever wins it because it is insanely beautiful and so soft. So let's now talk about the yarn that I will be using to knit um, my entry for the cow. So I'm going to be using both of these skeins together. And these are La Bienne May Allure, which is a base made of 70% baby alpaca, 20% um, silk, and 10% cashmere. Is that right? Yeah. So because of the added silk, it's going to be a little bit shinier. Um, although regular alpaca does have a lustrousness to it, you can tell this is a little bit shinier, and that's from the silk. This is also a little bit, just a tiny bit lighter um, because of the 10% cashmere. So that makes it, I would say, I wouldn't say this is any softer. It might be softer than some alpaca. This is a super fine, so it's one of the softest you can get. Um, I don't think the cashmere is bringing a lot to the table in terms of softness here, but it's definitely lightening things up a bit, um, as is the silk. So this is going to have all that lovely drape and warmth, um, but it's just going to be a little bit shinier and a little bit lighter than if it were 100% just the baby alpaca. Um, and I'm going to be using these together to knit a Laura Lee shawl, which is a pattern by Lisa Hans. 
Um, and it's a really cool triangular shawl that incorporates garter stitch, uh, mosaic color work, and lace. So I think it's going to be really, really cool. Um, and I'm really excited to um, start working on it because this yarn is yummy. The final thing I want to do for the Land of Cam Camelids is uh, give an example of something that I knit last year using some Camelid fiber and talk a bit about um, the benefits and the challenges that I found with it. So this is my Flome cardigan. It's a very, very beautiful pattern that I knit in the springtime of 2017. And I knit this out of Quince and Co. Owl, which is a worsted weight, 50% alpaca, 50% wool blend. It's very nice and soft. Um, it has that lovely drape to it that you come to know from alpaca, um, but it's not too heavy because it is 50% wool. I would say my favorite thing about this yarn is the color. This is a beautiful undyed. So like I mentioned before, alpaca is available in such a range of colors and Quince & Co. Owl comes in a variety of beautiful undyed colors and this is one of them and you can see there's even a subtle marling in the yarn between the wool and the alpaca, which are slightly different colors. So I think that's really beautiful. My only complaint about this, and this is something to keep in mind, it sheds a lot. You can see that halo and it's very beautiful and that comes from having the very long hairs. Um, but this sheds a lot and the challenge there is because I knit it in a light color, I can't really wear it over top of black very easily and I wear a lot of black so that's kind of a bummer. Um, so that is something that I would keep in mind as you're choosing your yarn, your project, your color. Um, think about shedding. Think about whether that might affect the color you use or the project that you pick. So that brings us to the end of our Camelid chat. Um, I hope you found this engaging, interesting, educational, and that you are super excited to enter the land of Camelids with me. Um, please let me know if you have any questions about the rules of the cow, um, suggestions about, you know, yarns and project pairings and things like that. And let me know uh, in the chatter thread um, what you are making. So the Ravelry group is linked below in the doobly-doo. That's where you're going to find the chatter and the apo threads for this cow. And I'm really, really excited to see what you make. So um, I will see you in the land of camelids. Happy New Year, everybody.